Well, good evening. Turn around and say hello to somebody. Introduce yourself. Find a new name if you can. I have no idea. <laughs> it's Wednesday, right? On Wednesdays, everything goes wrong around here. Today, we had a evaporation pan leak through the ceiling. If you're here dripping over there, it's not me, it's the whole building. <laughs> anyway, on communion nights, we, we often have folks come up and share how they got saved here at the church or what the Lord's doing at various ministries. So we thought we'd pick a, a woman that I love to come and share with you. We, we'll be married 37 years, six years next month. <laughs> and so would you welcome my wife, Debbie. Most spiritual woman I've ever met. True story. Could you write that down? Yep. <laughs> I'm doing this temporary. You don't like that, huh? <laughs> All right. Tell them what you want to tell them. That's it? No That's questions? <laughs> You're supposed to ask I got no questions. questions for you. You told me to behave. He told me to behave. I said, don't embarrass me. Because she knows a lot of I stuff. I have stories. <laughs> So anyway, she's going to talk to you a little bit about how she got saved and how we got married, because it was a pretty interesting story, having to inherit a whole family at once, and what the Lord's doing with her now. So I'll just give you the stage. That's and, it? Yeah. I'll be over here if you need me. <laughs> well, um, I was born um, the daughter of an alcoholic parent. I don't know, there's probably a lot of you who have that similar background. And when my dad drank, he was mean when he drank. And um, so when I was five, I already knew how to call the police. I knew how to make a run for it. Um, <laughs> I had an older brother and a younger sister. She was um, six years younger than me and probably got the worst of the whole mess. But my dad was a pretty mean guy who I loved, and I hated him at the same time, all through it through my life. So those first um, 16 years were um, turbulent. They were up and down and in and out. My mom got the um, courage to leave. He talked her into coming back again. She got the courage to leave. He talked us into coming back. Well, not us. We had to come wherever she went. Um, and it was a continuous cycle until I was around 16 years old. And I always tell the story like this. I ran far away from home to my grandma's house because she was sucking up the kids my brother first, and then me, and my sister and I ever got out of that situation. But um, it's really exciting to see how I can look back through all of those years and see the Lord's hand, you know, um, one step after the other step where he was looking for me and calling me and drawing me. And um, just a few of those, um, when I was uh, in second grade, we had a babysitter, I did, that was down the street from my mom and dad, and my mom and dad both worked. And uh, so that babysitter took me to VBS. My dad was Catholic in, like, title only. I never saw him in church, but, you know, I wasn't go supposed to go to any other church. So she got me to VBS for about three days. First time I'd ever heard a scripture or knew about Jesus. Um, I can still clearly remember those things that I learned in VBS when I was in second grade. So um, just a plug for VBS, it's coming up. So bring your kids, your grandkids. That's so important that they just get to dig in at that time. When I was in fifth grade, I asked my mom for a Bible. It's pretty surprising, but, and I read it all the way through. I don't think I understood any of it, but I read it. <laughs> and then when I was in eighth grade, the Lord put in my life a really super great friend named Jana who was a pastor's daughter. And they had those Baptist revival nights where they had something happening every single night. And I 
snuck over there, because again, I wasn't supposed to be anywhere else but the Catholic Church, and um, that was when I first completely heard the gospel. And I know that I was, you know, I was wanting to respond, but I thought, they're going to tell my dad, and he's going to kill me. So I didn't, didn't go forward. But then um, when I was in the 11th grade, the Lord put another friend in my life named Robin, and she um, insistently con- continued to invite me to come to one of those concerts at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. How about this Saturday? How about this Saturday? How about this Saturday? Until I was like, okay, I'll go. (laughs) And when I did, I nearly ran to the altar when they gave the altar call that night. And um, so I say that I was the daughter of an alcoholic, but now I'm the daughter of the king of kings. And uh, from that moment on, the Lord completely changed my life. Just recently, I became back in contact with her, and I told her that that constant... Um, begging me to come was really c- completely changed the direction of my life. The Lord grabbed a hold of me and, um, and allowed me to find him. And I think my testimony, I always say, could be summed up in, with Psalm 40, verse 1 through 3. It says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined um, his ear to me, and he heard my cry, and he brought me up out of a horrible pit. And he's uh, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon the rock um, and um, established my steps, and he put a new song in my heart. And I don't know if I waited patiently, but I know that when, he, when I called him, he answered me, and he completely changed my life. So I started going to a Christian Missionary Alliance church that was on the border of Southgate and Linwood. It was called Lingate Neighborhood Church. And till the Lord brought me to Calvary Chapel Downey when I think it was 1977. And I started getting the word verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, and started to grow. It wasn't so quick at the beginning. I say sometimes two steps forward and three steps back and three steps forward and two back and a little progress in there. But um, I know that that constant exposure to the word caused me to grow. And then... Then what happened? <laughs> don't don't embarrass me. <laughs> so that was 1977. And then 1979, um, the Lord brought Jack into my life. And um, he was, I, I was, at that time, I was like, this is it. I'm walking forward. And not, this is, I'm going forward with the Lord. I'm not going to be distracted. And I'm done. You know, I was just like, okay. And then here comes Jack and these two cute little boys. And um, they, uh, I Jack call it, and those two cute little boys. Oh, no, three cute little boys. Cute Jack <laughs> and the cute little boys. Um, he, Jack was a widow, and uh, he was at Calvary Chapel Downey. The boys were two and four when we first met. And um, it was October when he asked me on a first date. You can tell if you want. I was, we're running out of time, but go ahead. Okay. No, no. You... <laughs> speed it up, speed it up. No, no, wait. Take your time. You're good. <laughs> so um, he asked me and my girlfriend for, to dinner, knowing that she couldn't come. Because <laughs> he was not experienced in asking on dates. <laughs> so we went on to a really fancy restaurant. I thought, you know, it's rich. No. <laughs> me and I was my from Pinto Southgate. picking her up. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we dated, we went, we saw each other from that day on. Um, it was October, and we um, went to dinner that night in October, and we saw each other every single day, and then we started talking about marriage. He, he said, but just in a few weeks afterwards, I know the Lord has called me to be a pastor, and I'm like, I don't know what that means, <laughs> but okay, that's cool. And, <laughs> and so we got um, engaged in January. We got married in, in July. And I went from being single and 23 years old to being a wife and a mom of two really energetic little boys. And then came another choice in our lives that I, we neither one, I don't, maybe you expected it, but I didn't. When um, the company he was working for, a Japanese company, said they wanted to send him to Japan. Just about five months after we got married, 
<laughs> and it's like, okay, wife, mom, country where I wouldn't, nobody would, I couldn't speak. I don't know how to be a mom. I'm, you know, I'm calling my mom every day. What about this? What about that? And um, that was just on how to deal with me. The kids were yeah, fine. He was, yeah, that was true. <laughs> and, um, and at the very same time, the Lord opened the door at Calvary Downey. So that was the choice to go. You know, it was an obvious choice because he had said, I know someday that the Lord is calling me to be a pastor. And, um, I often, we got to go to Tokyo several years back, and we thought, how different would have life been if we would have ended up in Japan? Um, but so that was the exciting part about it. In October, um, Jack went on staff at Calvary Downey, and I changed, added a new title, wife, mom, pastor's wife. I just coasted along in the background, and I always think that my, that scripture in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 that says, my grace is sufficient for you because my strength is made perfect in weakness was um, the really a scripture that I just really hung on to because the Lord was so faithful, and, um, and then it was just about five years later when we headed to Whittier, and um, Jack really, you know, we really got together and we felt like the Lord was leading us to make a big change. You know, we were in a thriving church. It was comfortable. The kids were in school and we were going to come to Whittier. And I was 28 and Jack was a little older. <laughs> 31. 31. Now I look at 31 and 28 year olds and I'm like, what? And we're out here going, we're going to, God wants us to start a church, but we don't know where and we don't know how. And I don't even think we knew what to call it. But I'm just listening. Just right? listening. <laughs> You're supposed to ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm not the visionary of a family. I'm so, I, the next step, every first next step is a fearful step. So I just kind of hung on and went along for the ride. And it's been an amazing ride for sure. You know, it's not without heartbreak or hardships being in the ministry and, and serving the Lord, but he's been faithful and gracious all the way through. We started in West Whittier at a home. We moved to Leffenwell School. We came to Morningstar here. This property was a Baptist church. We rebuilt and expanded, and I don't know what the Lord has planned for us, uh, but I know it's going to be good for sure. And the time flew, and the kids grew. We got first cars, and we got uh, first girlfriends, and we got you know, wives and weddings and babies and grandbabies. And um, I just want to encourage you to stay, um, just stay tied in with the Lord. You know, I've been, I've been sitting in church for 43 years, almost every Wednesday, Sunday, Wednesday night. And I know that that's what's kept us, you know, strong and, and even able to handle whatever the Lord teaches, gives us, sends our way. Um, Psalm 90 verse 12 says, teach us to number our days that we might apply ourselves to righteousness. And I, thought, I just read today, somebody said, if you take, keep track of the days, then the um, Lord will take care of the years. Just do one at a time faithfully as he leads you. Um, we've determined to serve as the Lord leads. We, you know, have opened ourselves up to however the Lord would use us. I... Um, Never thought I would be teaching women like I get to do and going to other Calvary chapels or be sitting up here. I never thought I was going to do that. <laughs> Thanks, Jason. <Where> are <laughs> Thanks, <you>? Jason. <laughs> We're blaming it on Jason because he's hiding somewhere. <laughs> Way back in the back. Um, but um, just Sunday morning, I know some of you told me that the Lord really spoke to you when um, in Mark 19 or 519, the man of the tombs, he wanted to follow Jesus. And Jesus told him to go home to your friends and tell them the great things that the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion upon you. And that's really the short version of 60 years. And I say that, I'm almost 60. <laughs> but God has set me in a You're amazing... 60? Almost 60. You're okay. a little older, right? A little. <laughs> the Lord's brought me to a perfect soulmate. He's brought, gave him, put, a, put me in a brand new family. You know, we don't, between the two of us, we don't have very much extended family. 
and the ones we do, they don't really want to hang around us. <laughs> so this is it. You guys are the, you guys are them. So 36 years of marriage and ministry, 43 years of walking with Jesus. And I can't wait to see what God's going to do. You know, he's got good plans for us. So thanks for letting me share a little bit of the story. Did I take too long? <laughs> I'm doing this here. Here, do Deuteronomy real quick for me. She's wonderful, isn't she? That's right. All right, let's open our Bibles tonight. Deuteronomy 26. We've got three chapters to cover. It won't take long. We are finished with the law in terms of the moral law that we've been looking at. We are getting to the end of the time that Moses has spent with the people there on the, on the border. And tonight we are just going to kind of press ahead three more weeks, I think, after tonight, and we will finish next communion with having a question and answer night and communion as well, and we're going to have a brother come and share his testimony, and then we're going to start on Hebrews 11, because Joshua is all about faith. So before we jump into Joshua, I want to spend a few weeks with you looking at just the, the chapter Hebrews 11. But Moses is old now. You know, he's 120. He's about to die He's going to be buried on Mount Nebo. He has brought the children of Israel as far as he can. He can't go any further. He's, he's been allowed to, to bring them to the borders of the land near Jericho. And for six weeks, he's almost six weeks, 40 days, he gives this series of lectures that you have in your Bible known as the book of Deuteronomy. Second generation bunch of folks, their parents, over 20, had all died because they had refused 40 years earlier when the Lord said, let's go in, to go in. He does a lot of encouraging. It's almost like a cheerleading letter, right? He wants the people to be sure that, that they do what God says. He, he reminds them of what not doing what God says will bring into your life. He uses examples and illustrations from their recent past, their, their long ago past, even the past year that God has given these kind of not warriors, but certainly sojourners. He's given them a lot of power and, and victory over all of the... the the tribes were on the eastern side of the Jordan, so they had been defeated. But the words tonight are pretty simple. We're going to look at chapter 26 and 27 and 28. And Moses' dying words to this people that he loved for so long are just, look, you can be blessed or you can be cursed. And it's kind of cut and dry. It's black and white. There's a line that's drawn, you know. You can have blessing or blasting from the Lord. You're going to get one or the other. And, and you have to choose for yourself. What do you want from him? So... We've talked to you about covenants, and I want to just remind you just quickly about them. There are a lot of different covenants in the Bible. The word itself means to have an agreement or a deal or, or to have a pact that's agreed to by both parties. Sometimes a covenant is made just from one side. A promise is made from one side. God makes some unconditional covenants. He made one with Abraham. He said, the land that, that I'm going to give you is yours forever. So, unconditional. To Moses, he said, you can have the land as long as you're obedient. If you're not obedient, I'm going to take you out of the land, and you're going, to, you're going to suffer as a result. But Abraham says, oh, you'll get back in, but you may suffer the consequence for years of not being in that place God wants for you. So there are unconditional and conditional covenants. Think Assyrian captivity or Babylonian captivity. Those were as a result of a conditional covenant. Uh, think of May 14th, 1948. God brought Israel back. That's unconditional. And I suspect from everything I know from the Bible, they're not leaving. They'll be there from now on. So Moses tonight speaks of curses and blessings and deciding to disobey his word or to follow it. That's, it's just that simple. So we'll get to those blessings in, in chapter 28 and, and the end of 27, but let's start in verse 1 of chapter 26 tonight. And, and Moses continues, and he said this, It shall be when you come into the land, which the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance, that you possess it and dwell in it, that you take some of the first of all of the produce of the ground which you shall bring from your land that the Lord your God has given you, put it in a basket, go to the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide, and go to one of the, who is the priest in those days and say to him, I declare today to the Lord your God that I have come to the country which the Lord swore to our fathers to give us. Now, here's a command that couldn't have been carried out yet, certainly, but, but the command was when you get into the land and begin to farm the land, when the fruit begins to grow, 
take some of the first fruits of the land that you've been given as an inheritance and go and declare your dependence upon God and his faithfulness. Take that offering to the priests, wherever God puts his name. He would, for a long time, put his name in Shiloh. They won't be going to Jerusalem first, but where that place of worship was. And God told them that they should go and acknowledge that they're in the land. This fruit came from the land that God promised to give us. It's an interesting picture, and it's a principle found throughout the scriptures, that before you're allowed to be a consumer, you have to be a consecrator, or if you will, a worshiper. You have to acknowledge God's provision before you can really enjoy God's provision. And so that was a practice that God established, and with very specific words, notice in verse three, acknowledging that God had done as he had sworn to them to do, that these are the fruits I'm offering to God in the land of promise. We got here by grace and mercy. God has been faithful. Then the priest, verse 4, shall take the basket out of your hand. He'll set it down before the altar of the Lord your God, and you shall answer and say before the Lord your God, my father was a Syrian. He was about to perish, and he went down to Egypt, and he dwelt there, but few in number. He has become a nation that is great and mighty and populous, but the Egyptians mistreated us. They afflicted us, they laid hard bondage upon us. We cried out to the Lord God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice. He looked upon our affliction and upon our labor and oppression. And so the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm, with great terror, signs, and wonders. He's brought us to this place. He's given us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now, behold, I have brought the first fruit of the land which you, Lord, have given to me. You shall set it before the Lord your God. You shall worship before the Lord your God. You shall rejoice in every good thing which the Lord your God has given to you and your house, both you and the Levite and the stranger who is among you. So, big practice, but, but all to say what? God has been faithful, right? I, I'm thankful that God has brought me this far. You know, true worship begins with acknowledging who God is, what he has done, the joy of receiving his blessings, but to seek to enjoy his blessings without him being in focus won't last. So worship, and God demands this of the people, proceeded from a heart that was preoccupied with God's goodness, right? You and I have been greatly blessed, don't you agree? We have far more than 90% of the world. I know you don't feel like that, and you watch the news and you think, gosh, we're, we're being so set apart and set aside, but travel, <laughs> Just go somewhere. You'll, you'll come home much more thankful than maybe you are now. You have such blessing from God. He's provided so much. And the prayer that they are, are asked to pray is really a testimony of the individual experience with God. You've brought me here. I was living out there. I came from bondage. I, I think, you know, as Debbie was talking to you, I, I think that if you don't have a testimony, work on yours. Write it out, you know, a couple of sentences there. If somebody asks about your relationship with the Lord, you can just kind of lay it out. Or you can go like this, hold on, I've written that out, and you can read it to them. But you're ready, right? You're ready to give a, an answer and, and, and make sure he gets glorified. Sometimes you hear these testimonies, it's, it's like a bragamony, not a testimony, right, about how bad people were, and they go, oh, and then I got saved. No, turn that around. Just don't tell too much of your junk life. Tell about the good things that God has done so that people will be thirsty to hear. Well, then he says in verse 12, when you finish laying aside the tithes of your increase in the third year, the year of tithing, and have given it to the Levite and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow so that they may eat within your gates and they might be filled, then you shall say to the Lord, I have removed the holy tithe from my house. I've given it to the Levite and to the stranger and to the fatherless and to the widow according to your commandments which you've commanded me. I've not transgressed your commandments. I haven't forgotten them. And I haven't eaten any of it when in mourning, nor have I removed any of it for an unclean use, nor given it to any for the dead. I've obeyed the voice of the Lord my God. I've done according to all that you've commanded me. Now, Lord, look down from your holy habitation in heaven. Bless your people, Israel, the land which you've given us, just as you swore to our fathers that it would be a land flowing with milk and honey. So first things first, first fruits, God, thank you for bringing us here. We stand where you promised to take us. Second of all, in the third year, God designated a special giving specifically for the poor, for the widow, for the priest, for the stranger, so that they wouldn't lack either. You've been blessed. Now, use what God has given you to bless someone else. You acknowledge God's goodness to you. You give him the first fruits of his blessing upon you, 
and then you become a blessing to others. It's the way God works. It, it is always that way with God. He works within your life to work through your life. He gets to you so he can go through you. And it is certainly the case here. Our Christian walk comes up short if we stop with what God can do for me. What, what will God do for me? No, he wants to be a vessel through whom you can work. Kind of like getting saved. He wants to save you, but then he wants to use you to tell others how they can be saved. So then you're called to share the good news, not just sit upon that truth. If you're in Christ, you're a new creation, everything's made new, and then it says you've been called to reconcile others to the Lord. So notice the prayer here in verse 13, 14, and 15 in that third year, that special giving for the, those who are in tremendous needs. He says, Lord, I've removed the holy tithe, the holy meaning it belongs to God, from my house. I've not eaten it while in mourning. I haven't used it for some unclean purpose. I haven't put it on the grave of the dead. All that to say, I've left it for you. It isn't I'm digging into something that belongs to you because there's needs that have come up. This belongs to you. And so, God, I've saved it for the poor, for the widow, for those to whom you've said that we should give it. Now, verse 15, God bless us. In other words, faithfully handing God, uh, handling God's blessing will bring even more to you to be faithful with. But digging into what really doesn't belong to you, and, and that's the understanding. If you don't put God first in this area, you can be frustrated in everything else. So, thank you, Lord. Bless, Lord. Use what we've given you. Pour out a blessing like Malachi 3 times. Bless now through the obedience of the people to the Lord to use what he has given them freely to be benevolent towards others. And then God, verse 15, might bless again. I, I remember reading somewhere the, the sentence that says, the more you shortchange God, the shorter your change becomes. And I think that's right. I think that's a biblical truth. You, you want to be the vessel through whom God works. You don't want to be plugged up where you're holding on to everything, right? Because God will just find another vessel. Verse 16, he then says, This is the day that the Lord your God commands you to observe these statutes and judgments, so be careful to observe them with all of your heart and all your soul today. You proclaim the Lord to be your God, that you're going to walk in his ways and keep his statutes and commandments and judgments, that you're going to obey his voice. And today the Lord has proclaimed you to be his special people. Just as he's promised you that you should keep all of his commandments and he will set you high above the nations which he has made in praise and in name and in honor that you might be a holy people to the Lord your God just as he has spoken. This was a big day, the day they would go in and dedicate themselves, if you will, to the Lord. So today you've proclaimed the Lord to be your God. Today the Lord has proclaimed you to be his special people. You're, he's your God, you're his people. So... His promise is sure. Make sure your promise is sure as well. Now imagine, before we read here in chapter 27, two and a half million people sitting on the edge of the land of Moab. I should probably try to bring you a picture. We probably have some from our Israel trips on the plateau that, that sits above the Jordan River on, on the Jordan side, on the east side of the Jordan. You can see on a clear day Jericho in the distance. You can see the Dead Sea. It is 1,300 almost feet below sea level to the south. To the, to the north, you can literally see all the way to the border. On a good day, you could see the whole land. The land is filled with limestone. I mean, it would shimmer, you know, in the sunlight. In fact, if you go to Israel today and look to build a house, you've got to cover it with limestone. That's the rule. It has to all look the same. It just has to be veneer, but it has to be limestone. And, and, and there were certainly plenty of it there in those days. So there, there's people just propped up on, on a plateau that looking down, you'd see the river, you'd see, you know, you'd see Jericho, you'd see the Dead Sea, you'd see Mount Hermon to the north. You could literally see that. And in certain places, not so much in Jericho, it might be too far, but certain places in land, you could go and see all the way to the Mediterranean. That's how, how narrow Israel is at some points. So sitting there, we then read in verse 1 that Moses with the elders of Israel commands the people that they should keep the commandments which I command you today. And it'll be on the day when you cross over the Jordan to the land which the Lord your God has given you that you shall set up for yourself large stones, wash, whitewash them with lime. Write on them all of the words of this law. And when you've crossed over, that you may enter the land which the Lord your God has given you. It's a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord your God of your fathers has promised you. And it shall be when you've crossed over the Jordan. 
On Mount Ebal you shall set up these stones, which I command you that you whitewash them with lime, and there you shall build an altar to the Lord your God, an altar of stones. You shall not use an iron tool upon them. So when they went into the land, and again, these are directions for just a couple of weeks down the road, 40 days of, of, of lectures for Moses, 30 days of grieving for his death, 70 days in all, 10 full weeks from the time they arrived at the end of the book of Numbers, if you will. But, but when they entered the land, they were to publish and sanction what appears to be the moral law, or if you will, the Ten Commandments. You would write them on, on a, a whole stone whitewash so that on Mount Ebal, a, one of two mountains, that's a couple thousand feet, it's almost just kind of a big hill, could see them prominently displayed. I mean, the essence of the Ten Commandments is reflected in every kind of law that you find, both ceremonially, if you will, and as far as governmentally is concerned, if you will, civil law. So how much they wrote beyond the Ten Commandments, I don't know. How much you can fit on a rock or two, I don't know. I know you can't put the whole book of Leviticus on there. So we suspect it's just the Ten Commandments, but it was sufficient for the people to remember that they were there being governed by God's law. The, the action was like the, the offering in many senses, symbolic to the fact that they were in the land that God had given them, these are his rules. So we are here under his auspices. The rule of life was his law, his ways, and it was a connection between their possession and their God, right? The, the, those stones with the law on them became the, the connection between God's provision and God's people. God brought us here, this is who God, this God provided this. We are God's people, this is God's law. If you look at a map, Mount Ebal is located roughly at the geographical center of Israel. So that's kind of interesting. Between the Mediterranean and the Jordan, from west to east, between Dan and Beersheba from north to south, it's in Samaria on the map today, if you look. It's just above the city of Shechem uh, to the north. Shechem is called Nablus today. Maybe you've heard that on the news. It isn't in Israeli control. It's a PLO-controlled city. Unfortunately, we can't take you there. We can go buy it and kind of it's over there. But it is situated across from another hill, Mount Gerizim on the south. And between them is, is a valley called the Valley of Shechem. So God really wants this law to be placed centrally in the midst of the country. This is mine. You're mine. These are my rules. And this is where I want you to put them. Notice also in verse 5 that along with the stones bearing the law, they were to build an altar. This is really the first altar that they were going to be building nationally at Mount Ebal, and it was to be an altar of plain stone. Notice, no carving, no tooling upon it. Uh, we, we just got back from Europe, and, and there are a lot of beautiful, in fact, you know, you're probably, if you've been to Europe, every city, you know, at least in Germany and Switzerland and France, Holland for that matter, um, every city has a, a cathedral at the center of town. All roads lead to the church, right? Every, literally, European city, and, and whatever it's called. You know, it's, it's in the middle of town. Now, most of these churches are extremely empty. They're, they're ornate. They have gargoyles. They got, you know, they got, they got Hercules next to Jesus, next to Mary. It's beautifully done. It's just ridiculous, though. And nobody goes. And people go, look how beautiful this is. And then I read my Bible, and the Lord said, I want an altar. Don't carve anything. Just put some dirt up. Just put some stones, one upon another. And I, th I thought to myself, as we were traveling through some of these cities, I wonder what the Lord thinks about some of these expensive, ornate churches that were built, quote-unquote, to his glory. I, I personally think he'd hate them. And if you look at them, I don't think you'd necessarily like them. You marvel at them, but that's about it. God's not interested in the building. He's interested in your heart, right? And, and, and he's interested in your devotion, not the architecture. He's interested in a life that's devoted to him, not stones that are carved well. I mean, God's a very different person than the world would set him out to be. In fact, I don't know if you remember back in, in, in Exodus chapter 20, it's been a while since we've been there, the Lord said as he was talking to them, if you're going to build me an altar of stone, don't etch on the stone or you've profaned it. Don't make people go up on steps to the altar so that the nakedness of the priests are not exposed, and, and then I'll bless you. The, the, the issue was, I don't want anything where you're meeting to take away from the glory for which you're there, which is me. You don't want people walking around going, man, this is a beautiful place. You want people walking around going, that is a great God we serve. He wants all the glory. That makes sense, right? So you certainly want a place to meet that is comfortable and it meets needs and, and you know, it doesn't distract from worship. But God doesn't want the building competing with worship. He's worth worshiping, right? 
And so whenever you find him saying, here's where I want to be worshipped, you'll find it's the most simple kind of, you know, unassuming place. And it isn't a place that people would put on the tour. But it is a place that God would honor. So he says, when you show up and you put the law out there in the middle of the country, make sure that when you come, you, you, you just build the altar without a tool being, uh, an iron tool being laid upon. In fact, verse 6, build the whole st- you shall build with whole stones the altar of the Lord. Then you can offer your burnt offerings to the Lord there. You can offer your peace offerings and eat them there. You can rejoice before the Lord God there. Right? You can rejoice before him there. And you shall write very plainly on the stones the words of this law. And Moses and the priests and the Levites spoke to the children of Israel. And they said, now you take heed to this. Listen, Israel. This day you've become the people of the Lord your God. Therefore you shall obey the voice of the Lord your God. Observe his commandments, his statutes, which I command you today. In other words, do it. The burnt offering, if you remember, I know it's been a while since we've been through those, it is the offering of consecration. Whatever you brought, it got completely consumed in the fire. It all belonged to God. It was burned up, if you will. Peace offerings were, were communion offerings where God got a portion, you got a portion, but you were obligated to eat your portion in God's presence as the smoke rose from your offering to him. It, it was like having dinner with the Lord, having a barbecue with God, right? It, it spoke of having fellowship with him, uh, eaten by the worshiper who, notice verse 7, should be their rejoicing before the Lord your God. This is the day that's going to mark your entry into the land as God's people. And God longs, for, I love the fact God longs for worship in verse 7 says, he wants you to rejoice. Isn't that good to know God wants you to rejoice? I see some people saying, oh, the Lord is good. The Lord is good. And nobody's buying it. He is good. And you have good reason to rejoice. But well, before this took place and all of these things, Moses then commanded the people on that same day, verse 11, and he said, look, these are going to stand on Mount Gerizim, or Gerizim to bless the people when you cross over the Jordan. And he assigned the tribes of Simeon and Levi, Judah, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin. And he said, and these will stand on Mount Ebal to curse Reuben and Gad, Asher and Zebulun, Dan and Naphtali. And the Levites shall speak with a loud voice and say to all of the men of Israel. So... Before they were to go in and do all of these things, the priests were now to stand on Mount Gerizim and read aloud what we will read here in the rest of the chapter, 12 woes, out loud. Can you imagine the acoustics being so good in places that so many people could hear it? But it works. If you go to Bet Shan in Israel or to Caesarea or to the Herodian, you can literally put 50,000 people in front of you and just talk on a normal level, and they will hear every word. We have Gerard sometimes sing for our, our group in Israel, and we're way away. I mean, we're... We're five times the length of, the, of, the, of our sanctuary away, and he's just playing really quietly, and you can hear every word. So it must have been a pretty cool place to sit. And, and so these are the curses, that, that are, or 12, I should say, woes to come upon them um, to teach the people. And, and notice with each one they were to yell out, amen, which means we agree, so be it, that's right. High five, Lord's right. The Levites shall speak with a loud voice, Cursed is the one who makes a carved or molded image or an abom- that's an abomination of the Lord. It's the work of the hands of the craftsman. If he sets it up uh, in secret and the people shall answer and say, Amen. there you go. Here, you guys have your part. Cursed is the one who treats his father and mother with contempt. And the, people shall, the parents shall say, Amen. cursed is the one who moves his neighbor's landmarks. And the people shall say, Amen. and cursed is the one who makes the blind to wander off the road. I can't imagine. And the people shall say, and cursed is the one who perverts the justice to a stranger or a fatherless or the widow, and the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is the one who lies with his father's wife because he has uncovered his father's bed. And the people shall say, Amen. Amen. Cursed is the one who lies with any kind of animal, the people shall say, Amen. Amen. Cursed is the one who lies with his sister, the daughter of his father, the daughter of his mother, the people shall say, Amen. Amen. Cursed is the one who lies with his mother in law. And the people shall say, Amen. And cursed is the one who attacks his neighbor secretly. The people shall say, Amen. Amen. Cursed is the one who takes a bribe to slay an innocent person. And the people shall say, Amen. And finally, cursed is the one who does not confirm all of the words of this law by observing them. And the people shall say, Amen. Amen. Well, that's the kind of the verse, the last one is the catch-all, right? If you don't like any of these other ones, hey, cursed are you if you didn't do all of these. So there you go. Well, we now come to the the blessing chapter. It's a long one, and and we'll get through it in plenty of time. Um, 
But there are 14 verses of blessing, including three where Moses relates these promises as conditional to obedience. He just says, here's God wants to bless you, but it only comes if you'll obey the Lord. It then is followed by 54 verses of curses for disobedience. And you read that and you say to yourself, well, that kind of seems out of balance. But I guess people do much more disobeying than obeying. And God doesn't want you to get lost. So he kind of warns of every misstep. God's good. He's merciful. He, he's holy. He's long-suffering. He's also just. So verse 1 says, Now it shall come to pass if, and there's the operative word. And it literally does mean if. If you will diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, if you will observe carefully his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all of the nations of the earth, and all of these blessings will come upon you and overtake you. I love that. Because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. The operative word is if. Blessings overtake you. That, that means you're going one way and the blessings just catch up from behind. Right? You're not blessed enough. How, how I wish I could convince people that doing things God's way will bring life and joy and peace and blessing. Oh, you can't. Because everyone thinks they've got it figured out. But this is what God has to say. Now, it would naturally follow that if you do the opposite, you violate, you ignore, you put off, you disobey God's word, that instead of the blessings overtake you, the blasting will overtake you. And the consequence of your choices are almost built into the choice, right? You just kind of, it just kind of follows you around and it catches up and it, it takes you over. So often we, we, we find people giving lip service to the Bible, God's word. Oh yeah, we believe the Bible, but they don't do it. They don't buy it. They, they say it. And, and, and if there's a frustration to being a pastor, it's people that, that, that smile to your face and then walk away from God. It's frustrating because there's no life to be found there. And you know it. And I think they know it. But they do it anyway. So I don't know how much more blessed you could get than your blessings overtake you. But, but here's what the Lord says. Blessed will you be in the city and in the country the fruit of your body, the produce of the ground, the increase of the herds, the increase of the cattle, the offspring of the flock. Blessed shall your basket be and your kneading bowl. Blessed you shall be when you come in. Blessed you shall be when you go out. Everywhere you turn, blessing awaits the faithful one who, according to verse 1, if he will diligently obey God's voice. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before your face. They shall come against you one way and flee before you seven ways. The Lord will command the blessings upon you in your storehouses. To all which you set your hand, he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself. Just as he has sworn to you, if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways, all of the people of the earth shall see you're called by the name of the Lord. They'll be afraid of you. And the Lord will grant you plenty of goods, the fruit of your body and the increase of the livestock and the produce of your ground and the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. The Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens to give the rain to your land in its seasons, to bless all of the work of your hands. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. You shall, not, you shall be above only and not beneath. If you heed the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and are careful to observe them, don't turn aside from any of the words which I command you this day, to the right or to the left, to go after other gods to serve them. Conditional, right? Verse 9, if. Verse 14, if. If, if. And then chapter, verse 15 starts with the word, but. But. Here's the ifs, and now the but. But. Now you're going to be the tail, not the head. It shall come to pass if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today, that all of these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Cursed will you be in the city, in the country, in your basket, in your kneading bowl, the fruit of your body, the produce of your land, the increase of your cattle, the offspring of your flocks when you come in, and cursed you'll be when you go out. Now, th these are just the exact opposite of the first 14, right? Either God's blessings chase you down or his cursings bring you back. Is that a good promise? God will either overwhelm you with blessings or take you down to cursing so that he might, in hopes of bringing you back to your senses. Verse 20, the Lord will send on you cursing and confusion. 
He will rebuke you in all that you set your hand to do until you're destroyed, until you perish quickly because of the wickedness of your doings. You've forsaken him. And the Lord will make the plague cling to you until he's consumed you from the land which you're going to possess. The Lord will strike you with consumption and fever and inflammation, severe burning fevers and the sword and scorching and mildew, and they shall pursue you until you perish. And the heavens which are over you shall be like bronze. The earth will become like iron, and the Lord will change the rain of your land to powder and dust. From the heaven it shall come down upon you until you are destroyed. And the Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You will go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them, and you shall become troublesome to all of the kingdoms of the earth. Now, 800 years down the road from what we're reading, the nation that had so neglected the Lord found the Babylonians coming in and absolutely taking them out. Tons of folks died. Many were put, you know, in prisons. They were all led away hundreds of miles away for 70 years, kept in a place that God put them so that they might learn not to to turn to other gods, but to turn to him. So Moses, without knowing as much, certainly, was prophesying of what would happen. Here's the blessings, and, and you can find blessed years in, in the, Israel's history, especially in Judah, some of the, the kings and all brought great blessings, but more often than not, it was this trouble. Verse 20, it talks about um, destroying and perishing. It's not a lo- annihilation, it literally means to overthrow and to flee. The, the two words are shamat and avat. It, it literally means you, you, you're overwhelmed and then you're chased away. It doesn't, the destroy and perish maybe gives you the wrong idea. Um, Verse 26, your carcasses will be food for the birds of the air, the beasts of the earth. No one shall frighten them away. How powerless are we when we set God aside? The Lord will strike you with the boils of Egypt and tumors and scabs and itches from which you cannot be healed. He'll strike you with madness and blindness, confusion of heart. You'll grope at noonday like a blind man gropes in the darkness. You'll not prosper in your ways. You'll be oppressed and plundered continually, and no one will save you. Pretty terrible. None of these are memory verses, by the way. (laughs) You shall betroth a wife, but another man shall lie with her. You shall build a house, you'll not dwell in it. You'll plant a vineyard, you'll get no grapes. Your ox shall be slaughtered before your eyes, you shall not eat of it. Your donkey, violently taken away from before you, shall not be restored to you. Your sheep shall be given to your enemies. You shall have no one to rescue them. And your sons and your daughters shall be given to another people, and your eyes shall look and fail with longing for them all day long. There shall be no strength in your hand. A nation whom you have not known will eat the fruit of your land, the produce of your labor. You'll be only oppressed and crushed continually, driven mad because of the sight which your eyes have seen. The Lord will strike you in the knees and on the legs, boils which cannot be healed from the sole of your feet to the top of your head, and the Lord will bring you and the king whom you set over you to a nation which neither you nor your fathers have known, and there you shall serve other gods of wood and of stones, and you shall become an astonishment and a proverb and a byword among the nations wherever the Lord shall drive you. Pretty tough stuff. But I'm hoping that if you're sitting on the, on the fence there getting ready to go in, that you're going, I'm memorizing them blessing verses. I don't want any part of this. You know, if the Lord lays it out, you say, well, that's kind of cruel. Yeah, but he told you. Don't go there, you'll get hurt. Don't go there, you'll die. Don't go there, you'll be mistreated and overwhelmed. Don't go there. And and even history, and you know, prophecy is only history in advance, right? And and, and God can prophesy through his people because God knows the future. But, but, you know, Zedekiah was the last king of Judah, 2 Kings, maybe 25. And he tried to escape when the Babylonians came in. He was kind of a vassal king. He wasn't a very godly man. But but he ran to Jericho, to this place that they're sitting right across from. And then they grabbed him and they brought him down the road to a place called Riblah, where the enemy, the Babylonians, killed his sons before his eyes. And then they put out his eyes. It's the last thing you see. And then you read here, you'll be driven mad because of the sight of the things that your eyes have seen. And you go, man, that's exactly what took place years down the road. God knew they would one day have to have an earthly king. Notice what he says here in verse uh, 36. The Lord will bring you and the king whom you set over you for, uh, to a nation which you didn't know. I mean, they, one day they wanted an earthly king. It's, it's years down the road. But notice what he says in verse 37. This nation that was chosen by him with such privilege and blessing can become either a tremendous witness or a byword. The word byword or proverb in the sense means an object of ridicule. I think, 
I think maybe the NIV talks about it being a, 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 uh, an object of scorn. Um, it, but that's exactly what happened. It, it came to them this way because they decided that they didn't want to follow the Lord. Look, God made a new covenant today with man. He sends his son Jesus to die. He says he's the only way to heaven. He's the only name given among men whereby you can be saved. If you believe in him, you'll be blessed. You'll have glory, man. Your life will be awesome. You write them off, look out for the boils and the terror and the byword in your life that just kind of comes and goes and you become the object of scorn because you've rejected the one way of life. Same thing here. Same thing here. Verse 38 says, You shall plant vineyards and tend them, but you won't drink the wine of them nor gather the grapes, for the worms will eat them. Now you're fighting with God. You shall have olive trees throughout your territories, but you, shan't, you will not be able to anoint yourself with the oil, for your olives will just drop off. You'll have children, sons and daughters, but they'll not be yours. They'll go into captivity. And locusts will consume your land and the produce of your land. The alien among you, the, the foreigner, if you will, will rise higher and higher above you, and you'll go down lower and lower. You'll be overrun. And he shall lend to you, but you shall not lend to him. He shall be the head, and you'll be the tail. Moreover... All of these curses shall come upon you, pursue you, and overtake you until you're destroyed. And here's the reason. Because you didn't obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments, statutes, which he commanded you. That's the kicker, right? That's the summary verse. And I would think if you heard this from Moses, who had to be the most revered person in Jewish history, maybe still is to this day, right? The, the guy they looked to more than anything else. And two and a half million people going, yeah, whatever, Moses. Can you get back to those blessings? They never took this to heart. And I, and I would suggest to you that there are a lot of Christians today, read their Bible, read what God has said not to do and to do, and they don't take it to heart. We just kind of play around the edges, right? We play around the fringes. We want the blessings. We don't want the warnings. And we hope if we get warnings, it won't happen to us. Verse 46, And they shall be upon you for a sign and a wonder on your descendants forever. You didn't serve the Lord your God with joy, or gladness of hearts, for the abundance of everything. Isn't that a powerful scripture? God has given you so much, and you still can't serve him with joy. You still can't be moved. Sounds like the U.S. today, isn't it? I mean, in many ways, righteousness exalts the nation. So God always rules in the affairs of men. If a nation will establish itself dependent upon God and follow his ways, blessing will follow. That, you know, you read America's history. There was a time when when our, our, our leaders were writing, America, America, God shed his grace on you. And putting God we trust on our money, not in our money we trust. But that's kind of a days gone by, isn't it? We're still enjoying the benefits of a faithful forefathers, but we're losing them quickly. A and here's why. I'm not, I'm not trying to compare us with Israel. Israel is God's chosen people. They're very unique in their relationship. But the principles, I don't think, can change. So in our prosperity, we find ourselves slipping away. We have the benefits of his blessings, but now we have, you know, a, a Supreme Court and a government that doesn't believe God should play any part in the national consciousness of man. And you can have that, but you better read the rest of the chapter then because you're getting everything else too. And it isn't going to be good for us. You know, there, you know there's, there might be a reason you don't see America in end-time prophecy. Maybe we just don't exist by then. You don't know. But, but I'll tell you what, we better be praying for our nation. And, and a lot. You know, humanists whose God is materialism wants to silence the cries of a few uh, to keep God on the throne. So we'll keep him out of school and we'll take the nativity scenes down and the Ten Commandments and we'll replace them with abortion rights rallies and homosexual marriage and all manner of sin. And then we'll go, oh God, where's God? Oh, he's still there. He wrote this whole chapter should read the whole thing. And what do we get as a result? We become precarious. We begin to deteriorate. And, and most world governments over the years have, have fallen apart from within, right? The curses begin. Rampant disease, insurmountable social problems, weak international, falling apart from the inside out, moral fabric, tearing at our culture, and the church stuck in its side. So uh, from strength to God, in God to weakness without him, God has warned us. May we listen to his warning. The children of Israel did not. God is still faithful. All it takes is one word from him, eh? And maybe the church should do more praying and less worrying. 
Verse 47 says, because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and gladness of heart for the abundance of everything, therefore you shall serve your enemies, whom the Lord will send against you, and you, it'll end up in hunger and thirst and nakedness and in need of everything. And he'll put a yoke of iron on your neck until he's destroyed you. And the Lord will bring a nation against you from afar, from the ends of the earth, who will fly as swift as an eagle flies, a nation whose language you won't understand, a nation of fierce countenance who doesn't respect the elderly nor show favor to the young. They shall eat the increase of your livestock and the produce of your land until you're destroyed. They shall not leave your grain or new wine or oil or the increase of your cattle or the offspring of your flock until they have destroyed you. They shall besiege you in your gates until your high and fortified walls in which you trust will come down throughout your land and they shall besiege you at your gates throughout all your land which the Lord your God has given you. You shall eat the fruit of your own body, the flesh of your sons and daughters whom the Lord will give you in the siege and in the desperate straits in which your enemy shall distress you. Literally fulfilled, by the way, in 2 Kings chapter 6 and I think Lamentations chapter 2. Today, a, a new era has begun for the nation of Israel. For the first time since 70 AD, God has brought them into their homeland. Now, we've read about all the going and coming, but now they, they find themselves in the land. There's probably no, I think, people group in the world that has suffered more than the Jews or longer. Today, the land is being prepared for God's final dealings with them as a nation, with the world in rebellion. It's one of those unconditional promises. But, but here's the problem with man apart from God. Oh, God is going to be faithful, but look how man has been so unfaithful and how much he has suffered as a result. Verse 54 says, The sensitive and very refined man among you will be hostile towards his brother, to the wife of his bosom, to the rest of his children, whom he leaves behind, that he will not give any of them the flesh of his children to eat, because he has nothing left in the siege. Desperate straits, in which your enemy shall distress you in the gates. The tender and the delicate woman among you who would not venture to set the sole of her feet on the ground because of her delicateness and sensitivity will refuse, will refuse to the husband of her bosom and to her son and her daughter her placenta which comes out from between her feet and her children which she bears. She will eat them secretly for lack of everything in the siege. Desperate straits which your enemies shall distress you at your gates. If you do not carefully observe the words of this law written in this book, that you may fear this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God. Then the Lord will bring upon you and your descendants extraordinary plagues, great and prolonged, serious and prolonged sicknesses. He'll bring back on you the diseases of Egypt, of which you were afraid, and they shall cling to you. Why does that happen? Because they had kosher laws. They go, oh, we'll just eat like everybody else. And every sickness and every plague not written in the book of this law will the Lord bring until you're destroyed. You shall be left few in number, whereas you were as the stars of heaven in multitude, because you wouldn't obey the voice of the Lord your God. It shall be ju just as you, uh, that just as the Lord your God rejoiced over you to do you good and multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you, bring you to nothing. You shall be plucked from off the land where you go to possess. And the Lord will scatter you from among the people from one end of the earth to the other. There you shall serve other gods which neither you or your fathers have known, wood and stone. And among those nations you'll find no rest, nor shall the sole of your feet have a resting place. But there the Lord will give you a trembling heart and a failing eye and an anguish of soul, and your life will hang in doubt before you. You'll fear day and night, have no assurance of life. In the morning you say, oh, I wish it were evening. In the evening, oh, that it were morning, because of the fear which terrifies your heart, because of the sight which your eyes have seen, and the Lord will take you back to Egypt in ships. By the way of which I said to you, you shall never see it again. And there you shall be offered for sale to your enemies as a male and female slave, but no one will buy you. Boy, that's miserable, isn't it? We're going to stop reading. I can't take it anymore. <laughs> surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, or surely misery and grief will follow me. Or is that Psalm 23, verse 6, I think. So are you willing to obey? I don't want any part of the rest of these chapters, for sure. Father, we thank you tonight that you are a God who warns us, who loves us, who will go to extreme lengths to allow us to taste and see the consequences of disobedience so that we won't stay there or die there. That you love us enough to warn us ahead of time, that you, you tell us about pursuing the flesh or the ways of life or selfishness or ambition that isn't you know, spiritually driven. You, you give us so many good things to know and yet we seem to take heed to so few of them. 
We want your blessing, not your warnings. We want your, your, your gifts, but we don't necessarily want your direction. Father, that we might be willing to listen and take heed and realize that you're a God who's for us in every way, but that the blessings are, are, are found at that place of obedience where we do what you say and act the way that you would want and, and put priorities in our life that honor you so that your glory matters more to us than our personal needs or personal gain, that, that we're more interested in, in, in honoring your name for all that you've given us, for the abundance of all that we've gotten, for the, the blessings that have overtaken us. And we do pray for our country, Lord. We know that it looks bad to us on the outward, but God, you're able to bring change, to bring healing, that people will see the darkness in such a way that they'll run to the light. And maybe you're setting us up for a great revival. We pray for that, Father, that you'd give us another opportunity to be a nation unto the Lord, that you'd be glorified in this place. We, we've seen how it isn't right. May you make it right. May you start with us. And Father, tonight as we sit to have communion together, remind us again of what a good God we serve, how faithful you are, and how much you want to bless your people. So may we be doers, not just hearers. May we, may we act upon what you've said. May we do it tonight. Let's just begin to worship the Lord together. Some of our elders are going to serve you communion tonight. If you hang on to the cup and the bread till everybody's served, then we'll have communion together. <laughs>